Welcome everyone to um, the public health discipline group meeting at this annual meeting of the U21 health science group. Um, I think uh, maybe we should wait maybe a couple of minutes more. Um, see if we have any more coming in. with the result that we have less people. <laughs> okay. Then um, I think uh, Bernard, uh, Perhaps you should um, start. Okay. Uh, or prepare yourself because first Bernard uh, is going to talk a little bit about um, the effect the pandemic has ha potentially have on, on health policies or health policy implications. And then Emma and uh, her two students or to a student of hers, uh, will talk a little bit about um, how the pandemic might affect teaching. So uh, please, Bernard. Thank you, Martin. Good day to you, colleagues. So my uh, presentation focuses on health policy, on the health policy implications of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So, um, so the coronavirus disease has emerged, as we all know, as a new health policy challenge, undermining health systems, strengthening, um, um, as well as maybe the pursuit of those goals of health systems, strengthening um, and the endeavor to achieve health policy goals, particularly um, the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goal 3, as well as universal health coverage. So the COVID-19 situation reported by the World Health Organization shows that globally so far there are about 222 million cumulative total cases reported uh, with the Americas um, reporting the highest number with about 85, uh, you know, a million and Africa having the lowest, uh, you know, number of um, infections uh, globally. So it means that this is a policy issue that warrants, uh, you know, um, attention in as far as health policy is concerned. So having said that, or given this situation, there remains a need to understand how COVID-19 is impacting health policy and the endeavor to strengthen health systems uh, throughout the world. And against this background, my presentation seeks to review the impact that COVID-19 is having on health system strengthening, as well as to explore health policy and planning issues that are emerging from the pandemic. And the letter or the second objective or the second goal of this presentation is the most uh, you know, important of, uh, you know, of the two. So as for the methods, I used a literature review search or I carried out a literature review search uh, in which I applied the literature review to generate findings from COVID-19 response uh, policy documents from the World Health Organizations, as well as scientific articles from scientific sources, uh, sources such as PubMed Central, Scopus, as well as uh, you know, PubMed. Then for the analysis or for the framework of analysis, I'm using the World Health Organization Building Blocks Framework to try and understand or to try and explore the health policy goals, I mean, the health policy issues that are emerging um, uh, from the, as a result of the COVID-19 um, situation. 
So as we would see from Fig two on your screens, you find that um, COVID nineteen is impacting the health systems, uh, the process of health system strengthening, uh, in different ways. And as you would see on your um, left, you on your left, you find that um, there has been an emergence of uh, new policy issues around the building blocks. Um, for example, there are policy issues that are unfolding around service delivery, policy issues developing around in, um, health workforce, uh, policy issues uh, you know, uh, emerging around health information systems. And these are the building blocks around which health systems are strengthened. So we're saying that on the, around those health system building blocks, you find that there are new issues that are you know, um, emerging and these are having new implications or presenting new implications uh, for the attainment of uh, intermediate goals of health systems. Um, the intermediate goals such as you know, accessibility of healthcare services, acceptability, affordability, availability, coverage, quality, which in turn is also affecting the realization of the overall goals of health systems um, such as improving health, as well as you know, um, attaining responsiveness and um, improving um, efficiency. So in table two, what I've done is that um, I've gone into each uh, building block and conducted a literature review to try and establish or to try and explore the health policy issues that are emerging from um, those um, from around that um, system block, starting with service delivery, where we find that as a result of the COVID-19 situation, there are access barriers to healthcare service delivery or access barriers that are undermining uh, healthcare service delivery. And around this particular building block, I reviewed literature from um, many sources and amongst this is uh, literature from Rwanda where a study was carried out, uh, a study reported that there were access barriers uh, you know, uh, to healthcare services for patients with chronic illnesses who could not access emergency care, medication, and they had to skip uh, clinical appointments as a result of uh, you know, lockdowns. I'm sure we've also had um, situations in other countries where uh, you know, there were uh, access barriers to healthcare services, particularly in relation to maternal care services uh, during curfews, as well as during the nighttime um, at the height of the pandemic. Then another policy issue that emerges around service delivery is the need to continually test for COVID-19 so that uh, we know where the virus is you know, um, circulating. There is never going to be a situation where we say we've tested and therefore we've concluded uh, you know, uh, what we are done with uh, COVID-19. There is going to always be need to continually test you know, for, uh, you know, uh, for COVID-19 uh, if we are to um, effectively combat it. Then on the health workforce, um, issues that emerge or that are emerging uh, you know, from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, number one, the need to reinforce efforts to address the existing global health workforce crisis. I'm quite sure we're all aware that um, the global community is facing the global or global health workforce crisis characterized by the shortage of healthcare personnel, inadequate remuneration, retention challenges, as well as other, a host of other human sources challenge, human sources for health challenges around the world. So COVID-19 presents a need to reinforce effort towards addressing these existing, you know, global health workforce, you know, um, challenges. It will not mean that now we have COVID-19, therefore, the world negates these um, challenges. Then COVID has also brought with it the need to invest in the physical protection as well as mental protection of healthcare workers. And um, for this, um, I reviewed um, literature from uh, Cherish et al, um, who highlighted that um, the need for adequate personal protective equipment is as a physical barrier, uh, you know, from um, COVID-19 is emerging as something that is, you know, very important uh, to protect healthcare workers. And the importance of this has, has become more critical 
during the time of uh, you know, um, COVID-19. Then we also have um, the need to uh, protect workers from uh, you know, the mental state or mental welfare of healthcare workers, i.e. the need to protect workers from stress, burnout, stigma, as well as discrimination, stress and burnout. You find that healthcare workers are working longer hours attending to COVID patients, as well as other patients in health facilities then healthcare workers themselves, because they're exposed to COVID uh, patients, sometimes you find that they um, experience stigma or they are stigmatized and discriminated against uh, you know, by their community members. So these are policy issues that are emerging in as far as you know, um, COVID-19 is concerned. Then also the need to provide adequate support uh, for online training. I'm quite sure we're all aware that um, there has been a transition to online training and development as a result of uh, you know, um, the COVID-19 situation so as to avoid contact session. But then the challenges associated with that is the lack of equipment uh, such as uh, computers, as well as electricity, as well as data for healthcare personnel in low and middle income you know, communities, as well as those in rural communities. So that's in itself, you know, comes in as a challenge in as far as, you know, human sources for health is concerned. Then health information systems and research. Uh, COVID-19 shows the need for a functional health information system at all levels. And um, based on the study carried out by Lao et al that you are seeing on your right, um, in that study, what they concluded that there is need for every health system needs to have functional health information systems, which help to collect, to analyze, distribute, as well as to inform, um, to distribute data that helps to inform health policy, as well as, you know, they, it also, they also talk about the need for health research to help inform policy decision-making. I'm quite sure we also the importance of having data uh, to inform us about the, prevalence of COVID-19, as well as the trends in COVID-19, the number of people infected, the number of people recovering and so forth. So those are the functional health information systems that are you know, um, emerging as a result of um, COVID-19. Then another study in Uganda showed the importance of digital technologies to deliver health information systems at uh, you know, health information as well as services at a distance because uh, you know, as a result of lockdowns, people were not longer able to access health facilities. Therefore, they had to rely on digital technology to communicate with their health facilities at a distance. And um, this also helps, uh, this is also another policy issue that is emerging uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Then another, other issues are also emerging around the issue of uh, uh, vaccines. And um, a study carried out by um, Walters et al um, revealed that there are various challenges um, in ensuring access to COVID-19 vaccines, particularly for developing countries. Um, first and foremost, there's the issue of production of COVID-19 vaccines. And around the production, there are issues to do with intellectual property rights, as well as the scientific capacity of, in particular, developing countries to produce COVID vaccines. Then there are also issues to do with allocation as another policy issue under these uh, you know, um, vaccines. Um, and in as far as allocation is concerned, I'm quite sure we're all aware of the prevailing debate around vaccine equity the need to ensure that uh, vaccines reach out to all parts of the world so as to effectively combat this um, pandemic. Then of course, there's the issue of vaccine passports as well as whether vaccines should be compulsory. Then the need also to build public trust in vaccination. It is one thing for us to have uh, vaccines or adequate vaccines, uh, and then it is another for the public to have public trust uh, in those vaccines so as to take up those you know, um, vaccines. And as part of the process of building public trust, there are issues 
to do with breakthrough infections where you find that someone has been vaccinated, but again, then they um, test uh, you know, um, positive for COVID-19. That is information that will need to be disseminated to um, communities. And those are the issues that policy will need to address going forward. Then there are also um, other societal myths relating to such issues as microchips, where other people will say that um, if you get vaccinated for COVID-19, um, a microchip is being installed into you. Those are issues that are just you know, emerging from the vaccination processes. Then other people fear death and others fear that maybe if they get vaccinated, they'll be turned into zombies or something like that. So people become you know, afraid and that affects uh, you know, um, the public trust in as far as vaccination is concerned. So therefore there is need to build public trust in as far as vaccination is concerned. Then in the long term, there's also need for booster jabs as a long term uh, you know, vaccination intervention. And this is um, you know, um, cross, closely related to the efficacy, long term efficacy of the vaccines themselves uh, you know, uh, in the long term. Then um, around financing, um, one of the issues that emerge is the need for countries to um, conform to the 15% allocation, 15% allocation of the national budget towards health. So this issue now has become more relevant as reported by CREF uh, et al in the publication that is to your right, uh, you know, so as to help ensure that there are adequate financial resources that are allocated towards uh, COVID-19 interventions. Then of course, leadership and governance, they need to incorporate the COVID-19 strategic preparedness and response plans into all health policies, all health plans, as well as into the structures and systems of health at different levels in, uh, you know, uh, across the world or in different, you know, um, countries. Then there's also the need to ratify World Health Assembly resolutions, particularly resolution WHA 73.1 around COVID response, as well as resolution WHA 74.14, 74 which is aimed at you know, protecting human sources for health or healthcare workers. Then of course, the need to, uh, the need to continually stop new infections by enforcing COVID-19 protocols. So these are the uh, policy issues that are emerging on uh, around COVID-19, around which uh, future studies may need to focus on. I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to present to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. <clears throat> um, and I'm wondering whether there is anybody who uh, would like to ask Bernard something or comment? And I have a question. Bernard, um, I'm, I'm thinking about one thing that I have reflected upon, and that is that in past years, I would say there has been a very strong emphasis in health policy towards non-communicable disease. Am I right? <laughs> um, and I, I'm thinking about how, what a shocker for health policy people, um, for the long-term health policies that the, pan the, the pandemic has been. And I'm wondering whether there is a risk or an opportunity, depending on how you see it, that the pandemic will change that, that trend in health policies focusing predominantly on, on non-communicable disease. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, thank you so much uh, for that um, question, for that comment. 
uh my views are that uh of course yes at first value um there is a tendency for policy to focus on um COVID-19 alone um for example i'll give an example of the year 2020 you find that the world health um, organization resolution passed uh, at that particular time as well as that world health assembly that was carried out in that year 2020 uh, you find that most of the issues around uh, on the agenda of that particular world health assembly were to do with COVID-19 and that is expected however in 2021 there was increased re um, realization that yes of course we have COVID-19 but then we also have other health challenges like for example the non-communicable diseases that you are mentioning and it was resolved that there is need to uh, adopt a holistic approach or an integrated approach in which all health policies um, in addressing maybe um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to incorporate uh, um, uh, all health policies, we need to incorporate COVID into all health interventions. So it therefore means that um, uh, non-communicable diseases have also emerged as an important uh, you know, element or as an important area of intervention in as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Then in more recent times, uh, we're also observing that um, uh, media is the also, I mean, it, science is also reporting the importance of um, uh, addressing other areas of health, such as maternal care, HIV, as well as uh, other areas of public health in addition to COVID-19. And as the virus, you know, sort of like goes on a downward trend, given the vaccines, as well as their impact on the prevalence of COVID-19, other health matters also now, uh, you know, become um, um, important. Um, I don't know, I will leave this at this point so that other colleagues can also um, add on to that. But thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. I heard somebody say the other day, by the way, that uh, this past year, maybe the richer part of the world has understood what the double burden of disease actually is. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Um, any other comments or questions? Yeah, Martin. Um, just a comment, or rather maybe a point of discussion. Um, I wanted to find out, do you think like at some point we'll get where the um, vaccine passport will actually be um, used to for people to move around? Or is it feasible? I don't know, what are the opinions of uh, the public health people on that issue, the, the passport, uh, vaccination passport? Anyone? Well, put it this way, in, in Europe, there are a few countries which have already started to apply that. And I think France is the one which is pushing it the hardest. Um, and I think you addressed an important part Bernard, and that is the trust towards governments and, and trust towards vaccination. Um, I know here in where I am in Sweden, the discussion is a bit, tends to be if we use vaccination passports, then what will that do to the public's trust in government? Um, and the, the, the public health authorities are a bit afraid that if we're forcing people, more or less, <laughs> I mean, if you want to go to the theater, you need a, to be vaccinated. If, if we're going to force people to do that, then 
we are not going to build trust. So, and they're saying pretty much we need to, for the future, if something else happens, let's say five years from now or 10 years from now, we don't want people to mistrust government. Uh, so that's the discussion we have in Sweden. Um, on the other hand, when they introduced it in France, there were a lot of demonstrations, but vaccination rates picked up pretty quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, all those who have thought, well, I don't care, I won't get sick. It's not a matter of principle, but I don't like shots or whatever. They they quickly go and get vaccinated <laughs> because otherwise they, there are many things they can't do. And I guess when it comes to border controls, it's already there, so. Uh, if you don't want to pay a lot. Okay. Um, yeah. Norma Temba has written um, from a Swanti Eswatini in the chat. Um, yeah, when it comes to passports, I mean, it's it's not unknown. <laughs> it's not a new idea, <laughs> like yellow fever and other diseases. I can I can say in in the Canadian context, it's a bit interesting. So you may have heard that we're having a snap federal election here. And so um, we basically have five major parties that usually uh, compete. And, um, you know, we have a conservative party that is talking about uh, not making vaccines uh, mandatory in, in certain spaces. And then, you know, we have the, the liberal uh, side of things that, you know, supports the mandates and so forth. So uh, just to add to this, this discussion that it is very political. Um, there's definitely, as Bernard said, you know, there's this, this matter of trust building. And uh, we have, I would say in Canada in general, comparative to some countries, uh, folks are quite trustworthy of the government. Um, but again, there is some distrust. I mean, there's, you know, there's been these protests happen, happening around uh, vaccine passports. So we have uh, provinces that are implementing them here in Ontario. Uh, we are uh, in, our, in our educational institutions, for example, at McMaster, we have a vaccine mandate. But I would say in general, uh, we had about a 90% vaccination rate. Um, and so for the most part, folks are compliant, but um, I, I think that people are a bit concerned to see what else is going to happen next. Like if we have the passport, then what's the next thing? Uh, and you know, the, the trust in, in, in government, are they just gonna use it just for COVID or is it gonna be something else? So I think there's, you know, there's large concern around that here. Um, perhaps I can just add to that issue of um, trust in another dimension that is from the um, African, you know, um, perspective or from the African dim uh, dimension, um, so to speak. Um, you find that um, the trust in vaccines um, goes beyond, uh, tends to go beyond uh, the government uh, institutions or government, um, so to speak. It tends to be rooted in cultural norms, as well as you know um, religious beliefs, as well as uh, you know um, values and so forth. So we find that some communities uh, may not believe in modern medical practices, and as such, they were most likely to not uh, be forthcoming in as far as vaccination is uh, is concerned, and that creates another line of uh, you know of, of argument. Then. Um, then there's also the issue of social media and its role towards misinformation 
where you find that if you come to sub-Saharan Africa, most of the people that are active on social media tends to be the younger generation. And those younger generation tends to inform uh, you know, their household heads who tend to be not so active on social media. So whatever misinformation takes place on social media, you find that it has as, uh, a bearing in as far as you know, public trust in vaccines are concerned. Just the other day, I was on Twitter and um, there, was a, uh, there was an issue that was trending around uh, vaccination where people were saying, uh, were uh, posting pictures to say before vaccination, someone looked so cool and so good, but after vaccination, they look so different, they look sick, they look frail. So it was more like people trying to steer a debate around vaccination to say that if you get vaccination, are vaccinated, there are going to be changes uh, you know, to you. You are going to be looking good before vaccination. Then after vaccination, you look uh, you know, um, different uh, in, that, uh, in that particular um, situation. So that misinformation also tends to affect uh, you know, um, trust towards, uh, vaccine, uh, towards the process of, uh, of vaccination. Then the issue of microchips that I mentioned, I, I saw it in the mainstream media being reported by one of the newspapers. But then um, coincidentally, it was just also a few days after I had, had the conversation with uh, you know, some colleagues going around and um, that issue also came out uh, you know, in that to say people, some people were believing that, uh, you know, if you are to be vaccinated, therefore it means you are a, a microchip is being, uh, you know, inserted uh, um, into you. And then a few days after those conversations, I saw it on, uh, on the media, on mainstream media of another, you know, newspaper of a different, you know, um, country also highlighting that as a factor. So we find that there is this misinformation that occurs and uh, that can also be a source of, uh, you know, a source of, uh, uh, of mistrust in as far as vaccination is, is concerned. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then we have the whole other issue of having the world vaccinated as well. <laughs> and not only some parts of the world. Um, so I guess it, it, it's, a, it's a complex matter, we can say. Um, thank you, Bernard. Um, I think we'll take a very short break so people can run away and drink some water or stretch their legs or open the window. <laughs> Um, and uh, we'll reconvene at uh, uh, 40 minutes past the hour in six minutes. And then we will listen to uh, Emma and Raha and Steph, who will talk about some perspectives on education in relation to the pandemic. So Thank welcome back much. in oh, six minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, welcome back to the next part of this session. And uh, I will let Emma, Stephanie and Raha to, uh, to continue. And I think you're muted. Thank you. You'd think you'd learn this after, <laughs> you know, 18 months of Zoom or whatever it is, but thank you. All right, so Martin, thank you for that. Um, so I'm Emma Patu. I oversee the McMaster MPH program, and I'm joined here by two students, Steph and Raha who also serve as the uh, student curriculum reps and they help to provide input into program activities and planning. So in this presentation, uh, we'll provide a little bit of background on COVID impacts and learning 
and how this actually has led to some innovation and then a description of, of how this, this innovation has been good. However, there is a major uh, gap and there's a need for better connections. And then Raha and Steph will, will speak about the student experience of learning during COVID. So um, as we all know, COVID-19 has had tremendous impacts on, on learning and COVID has created the largest impact in, in human history to education uh, delivery and has impacted over 1.6 billion learners. As we not all know, it's been in, unpredictable. There's been changing guidance and many of us have turned to online learning. So for example, at McMaster currently, um, we are mostly online and uh, we, we have a vaccine mandate. And right now uh, the university is working on um, confirming people's uh, vaccine uh, certificates. So uh, at this time, uh, most learners are not allowed on campus and because of this process um, and uh, as we all know, things will keep evolving. And with this evolution, there's been um, a number of innovations. So for example, in the MPH program, we we're able to launch a professional development studio that helps learners learn about skills such as project management, uh, communication. I think we all know during the pandemic that's a vital skill that was needed by public health uh, professionals and also evidence-informed decision making and then also preparing learners for um, their, their placements uh, in the summer. So this was a, a, a great experience that we were able to launch during uh, the pandemic. Also with one of the medical officers of health in our province and one of our faculty, uh, we developed a communicable disease and control course that prepared learners to be able to support the public health system. Um, and they were able to, to, to learn about contact tracing, for example. But unfortunately, there is this significant gap where we had learners, uh, they might not have graduated, but we were providing them with real skills to be able to help the public health workforce. And we heard calls from the provincial government, the federal government saying, we need health professionals. However, there was this, this um, disconnect between academia and practice. And so a number of program heads across Ontario started talking about there's a better, there's a need for public health system strengthening, uh, particularly between the academic, academic space and practice. And you'll see here I've highlighted um, one, of the recommend, one of the recommendations around improving collaboration between educational programs and public health agencies to address systems needs and persisting health inequities. We also had uh, learners at different institutions that actually were writing petitions and saying, we have these skills in epidemiology. We understand how to help out with contact tracing. Please, please, please employ us. However, unfortunately, while the public health systems in Ontario and Canada, I would say did a tremendous job at coming together and um, you know, trying to curb the spread of, of the pandemic. But unfortunately, men, many of uh, the, the institutions uh, worked in silos. And so now there's this, there's this big movement around creating learning public health systems where real data from uh, the real world, from practice is then delivered to academic institutions and their programs as well. So that um, incentives, also a learning culture is fostered that can in turn go back into the public health system so that you know, the learners can then be directly engaged 
in, in helping out with the issues. Oftentimes we do have our students go out, but it, it is not sometimes a concerted effort to help bolster the whole public health system. In some ways, health services has done this a lot better than public health. Obviously there's a lot of gaps, but in the public health system, we need to do this better. We need to be able to see the data and be able to allow our learners, our faculty to be in that uh, responsive uh, system. So at this time, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Steph and Raha. Thanks, Emma. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Uh, both myself and Raha are second year Masters of Public Health students at McMaster University. Um, and as Emma mentioned, we're the academic representatives uh, from the Student Association. Uh, so in this role over the past year during COVID, we work to gather feedback, comments, and suggestions from our student cohort on their experiences with online learning through the use of some student surveys. Uh, so these surveys were really intended to provide real-time feedback to our program and our faculty to help improve the online learning experience during COVID-19. Uh, so based on these two surveys that we conducted in the fall and winter semesters of last year, we found some key themes. Um, one of the major themes was that the majority of students really preferred small group discussions um, over, over other online teaching methods, such as large group discussions with the whole class. Um, another theme was that uh, people really preferred having a mix of lectures um, with some activity, tutorial, or small group discussion as well. Um, yeah, so generally a lot of the feedback from students was that large group discussions online really didn't allow for everyone to speak, they really hindered the discussion flow, and were possibly an uncomfortable environment for students to share and ask questions. Um, and this uh, could have been a missed opportunity for students to really engage in in-depth discussion with their peers. There was also uh, a real preference for doing group work in an online environment. Um, and this type of collaborative learning environment um, allowed students to um, have positive peer networking opportunities and, and meet their classmates, which is really an important part of any program. Um, and we also, uh, not just yet, <laughs> the previous slide, please. Um, in asking students whether they felt a sense of belonging um, among um, our own master of public health community in the online learning environment, um, we noticed that 55% of students agreed that they felt a sense of belonging um, during the first survey and during the second survey that dropped to 33%. Um, and students cited a number of reasons for this, but mainly that online connections were difficult to establish. Students made suggestions like encouraging informal discussions during class time, having more social events put on by student council if possible, and also check-ins from instructors. Overall feedback noted that sense of belonging is an important aspect of the online learning experience and should continue to be considered. Next slide. So as Emma mentioned, there's a gap between public health training in academia and applied practice in the larger public health system. This was reflected in the student feedback we received, whereby in the context of online learning, students preferred more applied hands-on learning experiences to really feel more prepared when entering the workforce. Students suggested um, things such as embedding applied training into core courses, increasing the number of guest lectures in order to leverage the public health expertise that they have, but also those guest lectures allow students to get exposure to different public health roles um, and uh, trajectories for their own careers. First year graduate students articulated the online environment made connecting with mentors and instructors more challenging. And similarly with communication primarily moving online, students also indicated that clear communication and additional resources would provide clarity to program processes and make the transition into graduate school smoother. So we'll go to the next slide and also just share a bit about our own experiences in making that transition to our own practicums. 
Yeah, so we both completed a practicum uh, with the MPH program. We're able to complete um, a full-time summer practicum. And so mine was at the Canadian Public Health Association, which is a non-governmental organization. Um, and I was a policy material developer. developer. Um, and I completed this practicum uh, throughout the summer fully online. And this really allowed me the flexibility when choosing my placements um, because I didn't have to relocate uh, to different cities to work for, for various organizations. Um, throughout my summer practicum, I contributed to the development of a position statement uh, evaluating Canada's approach to COVID-19. And through this, I was really able to gain a lot of um, hands-on policy experience by evaluating the pandemic response in real time. Um, I was also able to take part in interesting online meetings with stakeholders from all across Canada. Um, and so although there are good things about being in person, the online practicum really allowed me to have flexibility with my placement um, and presented some, some new and interesting opportunities. And on my end, I definitely echo a lot of Steph's takeaways and sentiments as well. My summer practicum was at the Offord Center for Child Studies, which is at McMaster University. There I was able to learn about the child and youth mental health system in Ontario and primarily work on a service report on this topic. And similarly, the remote work arrangement provided flexibility and convenience in terms of eliminating commutes. On my end, I had the opportunity to attend and learn from several sessions and presentations in ways that strengthened both my understanding of the work I was doing as well as providing additional professional development opportunities. And similarly, with my fall practicum uh, ongoing right now with a pan-Canadian not-for-profit, uh, I've been able to remain in place and that's enabled me to better plan and manage a course load um, with a workload. And perhaps most notable um, is that I've been able to continue working on community projects outside of school and my practicum. Uh, next slide. So just to conclude, um, overall, there are pros and cons to online learning. Students learn best in different ways and learning during a pandemic will be very different. Um, experience for various uh, students, there are different challenges everyone faces. Um, this is why we found it valuable to provide student feedback to the program in a timely um, fashion in order to continually improve the learning experience for students. Um, thanks so much. Um, we are happy to take questions and Emma, feel free to, to wrap up as well. All right, thank you. Yeah, that concludes our presentation. So thank you for your uh, attention and we welcome any questions. So I'll lead off again. <laughs> Should we ever go back to on-campus education? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's provocative, but from your positive uh, experiences, one can wonder. I would definitely say based on student feedback, faculty feedback, my own preference, I would prefer face-to-face. <laughs> -face like I have never met Steph and Raha in person. Like we have worked quite closely on a number of activities. And, you know, it. I think there would be some value add in actually meeting them in person. Um, you know, I often wonder how tall they are, for example. I mean, that's not part of the educational experience, but I think as humans, we appreciate having that human interaction, which makes collaboration and working together, you know, even fuller. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, you had that finding that students, the sense of cohesion, I think it was, dropped quite considerably over time. Um, and I don't know, wh when when does your academic year start? Yeah, we typically start in September. Oh. Uh, so I guess Raha and, and Steph, you started September last year? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, because here in Sweden, 
we've been happy to reopen a, as soon as it was possible. So last semester we we were on campus for two months. Uh, so the new students were able to meet up and, and actually uh, the first two courses were on campus. And then in the third course, suddenly everything went online. <laughs> um, but I think our experiences here have been that those, even though it was seven, eight weeks or nine weeks, maybe, um, it was extremely valuable to those students that they were not just bubbleheads on a screen they 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 had more features than what you can see on zoom <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I so i think oh sorry steph yeah just to um answer the question about should we go back in person i think yeah, it is. It would be very valuable to be able to meet people and, and build those connections um, in a way that you can't necessarily do online. But I think you know, um, throughout the year, we've been trying to make find ways to make online learning better and, and improve it. And we found that there are ways that um, improve that sense of belonging. But um, I think that community and those connections. Um, can really only be fostered in person um, to the greatest extent that it can be. So um, I would personally prefer being in person, um, but the online experience was good as well. And, and there was a lot of positives about it, but um, I would prefer being in person. <laughs> I mean, the tricky thing will be when we're not forced anymore uh, to be online, how will we use online education? Uh, because I think we've all discovered several benefits over this past year and a half. Uh, we can have lectures from, you could have lectures from Sweden if you'd like, um, whereas that wouldn't be possible before because we were always thinking, how do we get the teacher into the classroom? Uh, and I think we've become much more flexible in that sense. And, and we ran seminars during practicum periods um, suddenly, which we never did before, uh, which is also an enduring thesis writing. And I, I, I think I think the whole world of education has widened and opened up a bit. But but the question is, what will remain, and what? will not remain that's also tricky yeah martin to your point i agree there are some good elements so for example our practicum students can do a fall practicum but in addition to that they are taking their remaining electives plus they have a capstone course to take and so you know in in the face-to-face -face world they had to do that all in person the commuting mm. time and at least now, I think it, it's a bit more manageable because of the, the time saved. And for example, like the capstone course, I can see elements of it probably stay online, but then have, you know, high impact in-person sessions where the students are, you know, learning more about what folks are doing over the fall and what they did over the summer. So I, I definitely think there, there's parts that are going to, to stay. Uh, if I can and add that, in, Martin, yeah. with, with, sure. with, with our um, uh, experiences at UJ, we have um, a program that like before, we already had like blended learning with some um, uh, more subjects, but uh, obviously not including the 100% online uh, MPH. But those with the blended learning, what I've noticed is all the things that can be done um, in theory have been put on Blackboard. And students are only coming on campus for, for the practicals, um, which cannot really be done uh, online. So the online is just used to coordinate them and to give them the timetables when they're supposed to meet and who is supposed to meet. And then they come online, obviously, with uh, following the uh, regulations where 
you have to be screened before you enter campus. You must always have your mask. You must uh, frequently sanitize, you know. And obviously, I think if the vaccination um, really kicks in in South Africa, as you know, we, we are always like behind. We still have a lot of people that are not really interested. Uh, then maybe we can introduce to say, you can only come for a practical if you are vaccinated. I don't know, maybe in future, something like that. So I think even in future, it's going to be uh, this blended learning. I'm sure it is going to continue. And I, I just hope they should be able to allow it. If you can, why not? <laughs> One thing that strikes me, we're we're back on campus. Uh, we started again. Let's see if we remain on campus. But one thing that struck struck me uh, when the students came back was that they started to say, "Well, is this lecture going to be live or online or both?" Uh, and we tried this kind of hybrid thing last year because there was so many uncertainties with both people coming here and, and there were some teachers who were not very happy to be in the classroom etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but this year we've said no we're not going to do some hybrid stuff so either it's in class or it's online and students are not very happy about this because they kind of like the flexibility of taking a lecture from their bed, I assume, uh, which I don't mind. It, it's, it's, you should be able to be wherever you like. Um, but the problem is that from a teacher standpoint, thinking about whether is the light good for this particular lecture or uh, am I taking enough breaks because there are people online or whatever it might be, uh, is so much different. Um, and not to mention sound, which I like to move around when I lecture, and <laughs> it's not that easy if I don't if I'm not mic'd up. So I, I think it, that has kind of changed also the landscape in what how how you as students perceive education to be. That it used to be going to class. Now it can also be staying at home um, by your desk or in your bed. I'm referring to my daughter. She's in her bed. <laughs> Martin, I have a question for you because one thing is I, I usually get caught in the middle because, you know, there's the university guidance of, mm. you know, where well, we kind of have two, like several entities, the university itself, and then our faculty of health science kind of operates as its own thing. And, you know, yeah. the university comes out like as a whole with messaging saying, yeah, we're going to be online, but then faculty of health science is telling me, yo, all, most of our pro programs are going to be, you know, online. Um, I'm just curious in Sweden, and a lot of our guidance comes from the province, like, what is the decision-making factor to decide if you're online or face-to-face? -face? Um, yeah. It would be the equivalent of the federal government because all universities are actually governed by the federal government in Sweden. We are a federal authority <laughs> um, because we're state-owned. Uh, so, we have to follow the same recommendations that as any other federal state level civil servants. Um, now they made exceptions and that's what, that is why we were on campus last year because they made a specific exception towards professional education where you needed, for example, all the clinical uh, professional educational programs, uh, doctors, nurses, etc., because they need to be in clinics during their training. You can't do that online. Uh, and the other big exception was international students, because Swedish law says you don't get a residence permit if you're not expected to be in class. 
So therefore, they pretty much said that international master programs and bachelor programs are allowed to run on campus, but with a lot of restrictions. So we were we a classroom could have a thirty percent capacity, um, and had to be furnished according to rules and etc. Uh, Sweden wasn't a face mask country and still isn't, so no mask mandates, but still. Uh, now there is still restrictions, um, no lectures with more than 50 people. Uh, our program is one cohort is 40 students, so we're beneath, uh, underneath that threshold, so we do everything on campus. Whereas bigger programs like nursing or medical program, they do all lectures online and then they do all problem based learning or team based learning on campus. So that's and that's from the university and it follows the national recommendations that you are not allowed to have an indoor meeting with more than 50 people so then that reproduces as no educational activities with more than 50 people. Um, but then we now know the government last week went out and said by September 29, we're lifting everything, except that you should wash your hands and keep distance. That That's the only thing that will stay. So from, October 1st, uh, all education will be back as normal. Though the university has said we need two weeks to adapt to the new situation. So from mid October, everything will be back as normal. So interesting uh, to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I guess every country have their own ideas on when to open up and what what is the thresholds you need to pass and i think what what's happened in sweden refers a bit back to what we were talking about before about passports i think most scandinavian countries will go along those lines denmark were first is to say okay now we are at a certain level where when it comes to vaccination um, sweden will probably be around 80 percent in a couple of weeks Denmark reached that two, three weeks ago. Um, so then the Dan Danes said, we can't let 20% uh, rule over 80%. So they just dropped all restrictions and said, if you're not vaccinated, it's your choice. Um, because then they pretty much come to the conclusion and, and most Scandinavian countries have had that as their main thing is to save healthcare from the big bumps that that's the that's the big goal so if you have 80 percent of the population vaccinated yes there will still be people in healthcare but it won't affect healthcare in the same way as it did during the big waves so if you don't vaccinate you're still welcome to attend healthcare. <laughs> but but I think that's so no passports per se, but we're not going to adapt society to the small minority that is not vaccinated yet. And uh, I don't know, I, my sense is that Delta has quite changed a bit the perception of who is getting sick um, and uh, we might also start vaccinating children it's under debate uh, because our schools have been open all the time um, they haven't they, they they high schools went online for a while but um, they really tried to keep them all open um, and there, I think, is another issue when it comes to online learning that public school systems don't have the same IT capacities as 
universities. <laughs> it's quite evident that um, high schools have been running Google Classroom and shaky, shaky internet connections and, and problems with, uh, I mean, we have legal issues with Google. Uh, you're not supposed to, in the European Union, you can't use Google. <laughs> Uh, because they haven't signed a European legislation called GDPR regarding digital safety. So every school in Sweden who went online for a while, the high schools broke the law. <laughs> and I mean, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the, 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 the government couldn't afford buying the same platforms as universities have. Uh, where we pay expensive licenses to Microsoft and others to avoid um, breaking the law. Okay, any other experiences or questions regarding learning online? I have, I have a question. I would like to ask it to Emma. So I'm here in South America, in Chile. And what we saw, for example, is that students are doing better than before about uh, if we consider their grades and their participation. So we have now like massive participation, everything. But uh, their perspectives are not that good. For example, they think that they are not learning enough, that it's not like the same experience that they have before. I don't know, what are you guys seeing like in Canada, for example? I, are the students seeing the same or not? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let Raha and Steph chime in on, on the student perspective side, but I think um, the instructors have overwhelmingly said the students have been doing really well. And obviously instructors have adapted their curriculums, but they've kept those core principles in place. And so um, the students are definitely learning. It's just a different mode of how they're, they're learning. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what both of you have to say on your side. Thank you. Yeah, I can go first. Um, that's an interesting comment. I think um, I still feel as though I've learned a lot. Um, I think maybe our per our participation it wasn't maybe as good. I think our classes were, when we were in large group discussions on Zoom, for example, I think um, perhaps we like missed out because it was not as good of a um, setting, I guess, to have more in-depth discussions. So I think, um, I feel as though we missed out on that. And I think just the sense of community, I think people would, even if they were maybe doing well academically, would have still preferred getting that experience of networking and meeting colleagues and making connections. So I think maybe that's more so what, what students are missing out on, regardless of how much they, they might be learning and um, doing well. Uh, so for me personally, I think that would be what I would feel I missed out on most. I definitely echo all that Steph said as well. Um, yeah, though the academics I think was intact, Definitely the discussions, I think we missed out on having um, more substantial ones to some extent or like consistently. Um, I will personally say like, I really appreciate recordings and I think the online space has enabled like so many classes and, and opportunities to be recorded and you can go back, maybe you miss something um, and that's supporting academics to some extent. But again, um, just the, social and interpersonal um, aspects of it, I think, um, have, have, we've missed out on them. Um, and they definitely enhance, like, how much you're able to take away from, from your learning as well. Another thing I would add is, so our students just completed their summer placements, and they get reviewed by their supervisor. And uh, they, we use uh, what we call the Public Health Agency of Canada's core competencies. 
And overwhelmingly, the student assessments were very good from the supervisors. So individually, I think the students are learning, but I think to piggyback off of what Steph and Raha are saying is that um, maybe there's been a few, well, a minimized opportunity for them to discuss what they've learned in, in classroom settings. Um, yeah, because our, our cohort is, you know, it's just shy of about 30 students um, in, in their cohort. And so I think, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, as instructors, we were more concerned with just like having the lectures going and not really thinking about that small group element, although that's just a big component of like the McMaster way of small groups. But I think as instructors, uh, settled in, they got more comfortable in facilitating uh, discussions. Again, I don't think it was perfect, but I think there was more of a concerted attempt because, again, we had Raha and Steph come to our meetings, tell us what was working and what was not, and a number of instructors would try and adapt from there. Uh, I know our students. Sorry, should go ahead, Martha. Okay, so um, for, from our side, I think it's actually the perception of the older generation that went to class that is actually not um, taking this very well because having discussions with other colleagues, you hear like, oh, so these are the ones that are doing online. It's like there's this perception that if you are doing online, then you're not doing so much. But um, from my experience, I've noticed that actually the people that do online um, actually do much, much, much more um, than the, the, the people, when I look at our curriculum rather, than the people that are actually coming on campus, it's just that the people that are on campus have that first-to-first -first interaction and they have the privilege of uh, talking to the lecturer on a one-on-one -on -one and, and stuff like that. But in terms of activities and, and assessments and, and work that they have to submit and everything, the online people are actually doing a lot more. I don't know, but it's just a perception that the people that didn't do it, they don't understand it and they are not willing to really accept it. Maybe in future, it will be different. But for now, I just see that gap. One thing that our students have reported is that going back and forth between is that their experience on campus, there are more distractions. <laughs> uh, and when we have gone into online, it has been a, never been a lockdown, but it's been you don't go out for dinner with friends. You, you don't socialize. You, you, you are at home, basically. I think that has affected them, but but then what they have reported is that when they come back, they start to realize that there are so many things that you catch in, in, in formal or informal conversation with other students, um, checking, have I learned something <laughs> the same way as you uh, over a cup of coffee? Um, and I think that that creates some kind of self-assertiveness that you cannot get when you are online. Those dialogues, those mini discussions where you're checking off, checking, have I actually learned or not? <laughs> um, and get af affirmation of the things that you've been thinking about or whatever it might be. That's the tricky thing with being online. Um, I personally try to have kind of a come and talk a little bit thing in one course. And there were three, four people who showed up and the rest didn't. So, um, so I'm not sure we are aware of the demand of doing that to, to understand whether I understand. <laughs> uh, but towards the end of an education, you sit there with your diploma and, and you're th thinking, Hmm, what did I actually learn? Uh, it's easier to know if you have been in conversation with others throughout. But I think learning wise, 
the learning objectives you have in front of you, delivering lectures, making sure that students do their work. I mean, lockdowns are great. <laughs> it's, it's studying or Netflix. That's only two things to choose between. Otherwise, it's three million things to choose between. I have a question about, um, so in our presentation, we talked about sort of this learning system. How uh, connected are your programs with maybe your federal or regional response? So like, for example, we could have literally deployed some of our MPH students to help with the contact tracing at the beginning of the pandemic. However, there's there wasn't there wasn't that connection for, for programs to say, here's our students, take them. I'm just curious from other places where your students involved, like we also have a public health residency program and they were definitely involved, but just curious about other students that didn't have the clinical background, but may have had the epi background and so forth to help out. The for me, or it was a for example, for, for in anyone, Chile. yeah. Oh, okay. So, oh, thank you, Emma. Yes, we have like this tracking systems, and what do we see like now? We are getting better on that, for example. But oh, it's it's really hard. It was a very very hard transition, and I think that the government is now just looking with like bigger eyes on that, and. We need to get better, I think. So I think that we are in the way for that, but it's like not an ideal, ideal situation. <laughs> yeah, in Sweden, it was never a question because the whole uh, process of, of the tracking system, yeah, it, it, it they never really expanded it. <laughs> That's a big issue. But I know, I think I've heard from UCD in Dublin that they involved students a bit in that process. Okay. Um, I think we have to wrap up because uh, there will be another discipline discipline group meeting. Um, so uh, if we're not gonna parasite on dentistry, uh, I think we'll uh, thank everyone for joining us here today. Uh, and especially Bernard, Emma, Raha and Steph, thank you for helping us out from learning. Uh, and with that, I hope you have a great continuation of this annual meeting, wherever you are. So um, have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.